this is a wandering quarry from the room. I mean, it's quite exciting to see quarries in general in the wild, even though it's not what you want. <laughs> Uh, so we're here very early this morning to look for tiger cowries as part of our research project on the Mary culture of model organisms. They are highly popular in the aquarium trade, so that's why we are looking for the species. So what we are trying to achieve in these three years is to see whether they do give us any kind of spawning in the lab. Cowries are a type of sea snail. When you first see them, what really attracts you is their really shiny shells. So they're not as easy to find. They actually do spend a lot of time hiding under rocks. That's why we're always squatting and bending our bodies. Very even curry. It's still not the one we want. <laughs> I have been doing field work as a marine biologist for the last 15 years and of the many different kinds of field work that I've been doing, I enjoy going to the intertidal seashores the most. Just one last one, huh? Since you're so cute. There's a lot of marine life that, you know, is hidden in all these spots. No matter how many times we visit the same seashore, you will always be able to see and find something new. Frogfish! I just spotted a frogfish, which is considerably hard to find because it's usually highly camouflaged. What's very interesting about a frogfish is a lure that's on top of its head. It lures in possible prey. It's basically like an ambush predator. So it would open its mouth when a prey is nearby and catches it right into its mouth. This is a treat for us. Raw fish. <laughs> Like, cannot be la. Because I was telling her it will be out and open like that. Then she's like, it's like it's yeah, usually like that when they bring a cow. Yeah, usually like that when they bring a cow. Yeah, usually like that when they bring a cow. Yeah, usually like that when they bring a cow. Yeah, usually like that when they bring a cow. Yeah, usually like Possessions. <laughs> Finally, we found the tiger yeah. cowries. This is them. This is exciting. Hello. Oh, this is huge. Oh, In the wild, I actually see more Caribbean cowries than the tiger cowrie. The tiger cowrie, I haven't really seen them in the wild at all until the Sentosa trip. So that was my very first wild tiger cowrie. Cowries are actually gastropods, snails, and like any other snails, they have a shell. But something unique is that they actually have a mantle, a sort of like a thin tissue that envelopes their shell to keep it clean and so that things don't fall on it. So that's why their shell is actually very smooth and shiny. Yeah, so this guy is actually looking very nice right now. It's actually got his mantle out. You can see. So the tiger curry is bigger than the Arabian, definitely. It's quite heavy as well. And very solid. So it's called tiger curry, but it actually doesn't really look like a tiger. So there's spots on it, and the spots are actually quite unique, so that's how I identify them as well. There isn't a lot that is known about cowries yet. We do know that they are single sex, they lay eggs, but there isn't really a lot of information on the larvae development and how they develop into juveniles. So I think that's a very big part that is still yet to be explored.
The Mariculture Project is a three-year project funded by the Tomatic Foundation. And it's really looking at advancing mariculture with the purpose of supporting sustainable aquarium trade and then eventually sustainable supply for potential restoration efforts. It focuses on three main organisms, your cowries, your clams and your corals. I feel that you know, we don't quite realise how much might be illegally harvested and how it could be unsustainable in the very long term if we don't do anything about it. Uh, right now, I'm skewering the prawns and cucumbers onto the feeding plate so that the cowries can feed on it later on. So I skewer them so that they don't float away. So we had them for about half a year at this point in time and we've mainly working on getting them comfortable and happy in our tanks. I think we've gotten quite a good hang of their diet and what they actually like. So for the tiger cowries, we tried fish meat, clams, but they tend to rot quite quickly and the cowries are quite picky so they won't eat. We found like frozen prawns actually quite a good diet for them. The Arabian is more herbivorous. It mainly grazes on algae in the wild. So we tried vegetables. <laughs> But then we found out that they weren't gaining weight, so we decided to try a bit of meat. And once we started to feed them prawns, they didn't really go for the vegetables anymore. So for now, we are sticking to just a prawn diet. She is very passionate about what she's been doing, which is culturing animals, from mussels to sea urchins and now to cowry snails. She's very famously known as Mother Teresa. <laughs> She's really good at culturing things, like very, very good. You would think that she's very quiet, you know, plays it very cool. She is very calm and collected, but you know, still water runs deep. She has green thumbs or in our sense blue thumbs. She's really able to get things to, to spawn and reproduce. She will come back over the weekend, you know, stay overnight, just to make sure that the animals that are under her care is like, you know, doing well, that they're living their best life possible. Although there have been attempts to culture cowry larvae, as far as I know, no one has actually succeeded to get them to settlement yet. So definitely from this project, I would like to be able to culture the larvae to settlement and get a baby jury now, I guess. <laughs> so what are corals? People may mistake corals for rock because they don't move and, you know, especially hard corals, you know, they're, they're hard. Um, people may mistake them as plants. But corals are actually animals. They're quite vicious little buggers and they will eat things like, you know, jellyfish, eat plankton and little critters in the, in the water columns. They can eat small animals and they can also get energy from the sun. So it's a very, it's a very strange animal, I would say. Similar to how rainforests are on land, corals are like the structures that give a lot of marine communities the life that they have now. So think of them as your HDB blocks that marine life can call home. Coral reefs occupy about 0.1% to 0.2% of the Earth's surface area, but this small area supports 25% of the world's marine species. So in the Mariculture project, we chose three different types of corals, the Porites, the Acropora and the Pachyceres, or more commonly known as the boulder, the branching and the plating corals. My favourite is definitely the Porites, the, the boys, they make fun of me because it looks like just a brown rock. But I love it because it's one of those corals that are actually known to be very long-lived. They can actually live for centuries and grow to huge, huge sizes. The largest one that I've personally encountered is six meters um, tall and like four meters wide. These type of massive corals have bands in them, like the same way trees have tree rings and we can actually age them that way. As a coral, they're very troublesome. Uh. They're very, very troublesome to grow. They really need the right conditions, if not they'll, they'll die off and they don't fend for themselves. Like, any coral that is nearby will easily bully a porites. Yeah, and they're just very wimpy. Yeah. And then you have Acropora, the branching coral. They're the prettiest and what people usually associate with what coral reefs look like. 
for scientists, they are mixed bag. When you give them the right conditions, they grow very, very fast. So on a project, it looks very nice. And then if conditions are not right for them, they die off very quickly and they rarely recover from high stress events. So they're more of a diva kind of coral, I would say. People like to work with them, but they're not that easy to work with. I'd say the pachyceris is a more uh, generalist. <laughs> Can you say pao <laughs> It survives quite well in our tanks. There are concentric rings radiating. And in our tanks, we can see that they are one of the faster growing ones. An average about 1 plus 2 cm a year. They are one of the better species to work with in Singapore because they're very resilient, they're very hardy. Almost like a weed in Singapore, actually. They grow a lot quicker than other corals. Pretty aggressive. They will kill other corals if they have a chance for space. <gasps> she's the boss, love. she's the one calling the shots most of the time. She likes to call herself the admin auntie. <laughs> Always the one doing all the paperwork. She leads a lot of the stakeholder engagements. I, I, I hate giving talks. To actually share about the work that we do at the marine station. You know, I get very nervous even just talking to you right now. <laughs> Yanni is a coral specialist. She was one of the first people to teach me about coral identification. The coral team is made up of Yanni, Weilong and myself. So we are in charge of finding very efficient ways to grow corals and basically to upscale our production. every day and it surprises other fellow scientists and other people who have taken out diving you know that we actually have corals and such diverse life <laughs> on our reefs in Singapore our water is very silty so the light that our corals receive is very low low to the point of being unhealthy for corals traditionally in places like the Great Barrier Reef, Maldives, crystal clear water, it's very pristine. They get exposed to a lot of sunlight, right? In Singapore, we don't have that, but our corals are actually healthy. They don't really like, like very bright conditions, contrary to what people normally believe. I guess that is the most interesting thing about Singapore's corals, actually. They're just different, like. they're just, they like the dark more. Yeah, they're weird. of getting coral babies. One is to get the corals to have sex. Uh, the other one is to get them to clone themselves. Getting them through sexual reproduction uh, is a lot more hard work because a lot of corals only reproduce once a year, maybe twice a year if the conditions are good. So as you all know, we collected six acropora colonies from the field a few days ago. Uh, what we are going to do with them is to bring them into the tanks, uh, collect their spawn as they come up, and conduct other experiments on them. If they do not spawn, we will try again tomorrow night and the night after. This might spawn also. <laughs> not sure. So how do we know whether the cores are ready to go off? They look like pimples ready yeah. to burst. Nowadays, we always call him Dr. Liner because he recently got his PhD. It's a new designation for him, so he's not very comfortable with it, so we like to call him that. Dr. Lionel Ng, we call him Sunshine, <laughs> and we call him also the second most handsome man in Singapore. Mm. Lionel has a bit of a poker face. We will always see him like play it cool and very confident. He always looks very stoic on the outside, la, but inside he's not. La. He, he's not very extrovertedly so, but he's hilarious. Uh... So it's quite fun. It's got deep, strong feelings about, you know, coral and coral conservation. He's the expert in the team, so he's the one that can really tell which coral is what when the rest of us can't. Spawning based on previous data, it should start around 8 plus, 9 p.m. It will last about an hour. 
we estimate that if it happens, it should stop around 10-ish. Coral spawning is when different coral species release their eggs and sperm in the water roughly around the same time. This is what we call mass coral spawning. And they do this so that there is a higher chance of their eggs and sperm from colony A meeting the eggs and sperm of other colonies so that you get fertilization and you get increased diversity of the baby corals that settle. Coral spawning is a very unique event that only happens about one to two times a year. So in Singapore, we actually have a major spawning typically around what we call Easter period. So it can sometimes be in March, sometimes it can be in April. And then a minor spawning event that happens in the later part of the year. So given that it's such a rare occurrence, we only have literally in some sense one chance to actually do something. The back, me further from us. So red light, they are less sensitive to it and they react more normally. If you use normal light, white light, the corals can sense it and they might get affected by it and they might not spawn. You see this slit over here, that's the mouth. So oh. last year we noticed that you're tearing out puffs of whitish clouds. Okay. Which is possibly sperm. Okay. So this year we are just observing this tank whether any of the corals will okay. give up. Yeah. Corals can be quite temperamental. So it can be a hit and miss kind of thing. And this is why we collect a few colonies of each species to maximize our luck. Does that one look a bit more fleshy to you? The bulbous one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not was a bit more exposed. Yeah. Mm. Shall we check the other thing? Yeah, nothing. So tonight, unfortunately, none of our corals spawn. Uh, some of them look like they were setting, but ultimately nothing came out. But it's okay, we'll try again tomorrow. The spawning of the bundles, so far from what we saw, it's slow, it actually slowly rises up. That one says we stuck in the middle, so I don't think it is. I'm feeling a little bit disappointed. But it's is completely not even out there. But that said, I think I'm still very glad to be here, reminding myself why I do what I do. Seeing my colleagues, you know, work so hard and also putting things all together and run this attempt. I'm counting the number of larvae we have, how much there is, and we can feed them the appropriate amount later on. Last week, we actually noticed that the cowries were behaving in a way that wasn't usual. Two days later, we noticed that there were actually eggs mess. That was probably a female that was brooding her eggs. That was two days after the mating position was observed. To me, it's quite an accomplishment because there's no way to induce spawning of the cowries. So it's really by chance and a bit of luck. And also some hard work put in also. <laughs> yeah. for this mariculture project, it fits in the longer term. A lot more time is actually put into the preparation to actually testing protocols. It's all very hard work. We actually, you know, sacrifice family time to be here to actually discover something interesting. What do you all think about the coral spawning? Like, do you think they will go off today? I think they won't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I set the expectations low first. Oh. Uh, always good to set it low first. And anything that happens is it's a bonus. bonus. <laughs> I just have to be very patient. That's pretty much the only character trait that is really necessary. I think that and having a passion to see things grow, to nurture small things, to not give up on any tiny fragments that might actually have life. It's not an overnight solution. You've got to keep your eye on the prize, and the prize is, you know, the environment. It's a long game. It's a long-term goal.
Uh, tonight is day two. We are, we were actually expecting to see a little bit more spawn because it's a bit further from the full moon, but nothing spawned. I see things in the water, but I think it is. The last few nights we've been staying overnight and it's really tiring. It feels like the only break I have is actually sleeping uh -huh, and not much in between. And then the cycle starts again. At the end of the hatching period, we collected about 20,000 larvae. So uh, we use a sieve to actually filter out the larvae so that we can concentrate them to count them. We pour it into a new beaker and then we pour a known volume of water so that we actually know how much uh, larvae there is in that particular volume of water. 200 eh, Meilin. Oh, that's a lot. But uh, we have to check whether they are live or not. They look live. You want to take a look? Yeah. Uh, based on the counts just now, it's about 200 larvae in this beaker. So today's actually day four since the first batch of larvae hatch. And we count the larvae that's managed to survive until now. Take some photographs, maybe preserve some for further analysis later on. They are so active. <laughs> I am still on maternity leave. I still have about three weeks more. But, you know, like, it's really like once in my lifetime <laughs> to, to actually get to see um, the, the cowrie spawning and also the, the larvae of the cowries as well. So I definitely had to like find my way back to the lab regardless of how. <laughs> so cute! Cute, right? Look at this. Oh! It's getting more opaque, the shell. So you yeah. see the reddish colour. Yeah. Is this a heart? <laughs> I, I really don't know. So. <laughs> I think things are looking pretty good. We have more than 80% survivorship. I do get a little attached to the animals and the babies as well. But sometimes you have to realise that culture work isn't always successful. So, and they do die most of the time. Science takes time. It took almost seven months before my cowrie started spawning. I think one of the more major milestones will be definitely when they start to lose their swimming ability and actually metamorphosize into crawling juveniles that more closely resemble the adult cowries. Give or take a month. Yes, another month. About three more weeks. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> three more weeks. Sounds easy, but not easy. Yeah. We've been here three nights, and frankly, we are tired. <laughs> because apart from the spawning work, we're also carrying out our other coral monitoring and fragmenting work. Even after all this preparation, uh, nothing went off. In our line of work, I think we have learned to expect the unexpected. That said, I guess we are still a bit disappointed. Environmental science work is not very easy. It definitely takes time, takes a lot of patience and persistence to actually see some results out of the science. So for us, it's back to the drawing board, modifying a bit of details, um, planning for the next spawning. What else you want to see today? Oh. Mm, oh. What do you think you will see today? Oh, that's a lizard. Mm. Look, Maya. Oh. Go around the trees. Mm. You're running up the tree. That's a that's a changeable oh. lizard. Yeah? You think you saw that's the lizard? <laughs> it's a common lizard here, but it is not a local. Uh. Mm -hmm. I'm a mother of two kids. Wow, Maya, you are so heavy now. My hand no strength. One, two, three, this way. Okay. My older girl, Ada, she is four years old now. And my younger girl is uh, Maya, she is one. Oh? Yeah, I think it's been a very interesting experience for me. Are your friends here? Ah, see, all your teachers are here already. Hello, Ada. Come, are you ready to go to school? Again, after Ada was born, I struggled with my identity. I'm not just a mother, I'm also a scientist, an advocate and a science communicator as well. So, you know, before I had my kids, I was very active in the marine conservation scene. I was always attending events, being a part of major activities also, engaging with stakeholders, communicating science and, and giving talks and presentations to schools. 
But after I became a mother, I felt like almost all my time was sucked in to really be looking after this little tiny human being that was so reliant on me. I, you know, I, I can't remember how many times I had broken down um, just, just because I couldn't cope with either of the roles. I think it took me a, a while uh, to realise that I, I can't just keep them separate all the time. And in fact, I'm a mother of, of science. You know, I'm a mother in, in working in the STEM field. So the algae is growing very long, but your fishes are eating it. So we shouldn't, we don't need to cut it. I think they are hungry really. Time for you to feed them first before we go and do other things. Slowly. Yes! Good job! Mei Ling is like our poster girl of our lab. Wow! <laughs> She's such a well-known figure in our marine community and you can tell from the enthusiasm in what she's saying that she really believes in what she's doing. To the team, she's a, a very more of a motherly figure. She's always the one taking care of us, making sure that everything's okay, making sure we have everything we need. Yesterday night, you were asked to look for what? The seeds? Ah. Yes. You can see that she's trying to pass on that passion, pass on all that knowledge into the next generation as well. Want to try and see whether there's something on the floor? Yeah. yeah. Come, let's go and have a look. Are you sure they're from this tree? I don't see any seeds though. Oh, yeah, look, there's a mushroom. You've been wanting to see a mushroom for a long time, right? Yes. Yes. You want to pong on the head? You want to? Oh, they bite you, ah. Okay. Cross the bus stop. choose between my daughter's needs and my work. And when it comes to that, I really feel this immense pressure on myself. I constantly have this struggle in my head. There are days where I just have to tell myself, look, I am only one person, I cannot split myself, so I have to give up certain things. Mommy, what's my mouth of feet? There. Thank you. You're welcome. Where's the dolphin in the book? This one, okay. Come, let's read this. A dolphin's white tummy makes it less obvious to predators below. Where's the tummy of the dolphin? Being in an environmental field, being able to see the fruits of conservation, the protection and preservation of ecosystems, and that, you know, they will be able to actually see and experience them. That makes me feel happy as well. Fragging is short form for fragmentation. So it's the process of breaking down a parent colony into little fragments. So these little fragments will eventually grow into their own colonies themselves. We do fragging quite a lot for this project. As fragments, they are of a certain size. They are less likely to die compared to larvae or recruits. Just like saw one chunk that we work from there. Uh, the branching ones are easier to cut with different tools. Uh, the massive ones, we of course use things like uh, hacksaws. So, how? Oh, half, uh. half uh. What do I enjoy? It's a job with very different work environments, I would say. I can be in the office one day, I can be in the aquarium another day, I can be out diving in the field another day. It's, it's a very not routine job at all. There's a lot of independence and autonomy in the job also, so that allows you to explore like methods to solve problems that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So it's really up to your own creativity, your own thinking, and that's what appeals to me. Weilong was finding ways to prop corals up. So recently, we explored the use of Lego bricks. We started with these small rectangular tanks, about 600 litres each. Once we ran out of space, we started to expand. We moved to these huge, round, 5,000-litre tanks. So the big round tanks are a whole different problem because they were not meant for coral culture initially. They were meant for fish culture. Nobody has retrofitted like a fish tank like that to grow corals. So 
I'm cutting the corals to about uh, 1.5 to 2 cm. So we are aiming for this size more for uh, logistical and practical purpose. They don't need to be such a big fragment to grow. So we aim as small as possible, but not too small that they'll get overwhelmed by algae when they are young. So this size also fits our Lego bricks, so they don't grow over our Lego bricks so quickly. So it's easier to handle in the long run. Okay, off huh? Corals, they grow really slowly, so this one in a year it probably can grow another cm. So obviously they would require quite a lot of uh, tender loving care to ensure that they stay healthy and they grow. And that's what this uh, program is about. Find ways to grow them as large as possible in the most efficient manner. My dream would be to see the facility become a coral nursery. as a source of corals for different things like outreach, coral restoration, and ultimately contribute back to the reef and grow corals in areas that they might not naturally be able to grow in anymore. Culturing of animals is a full-time job because they don't spawn when you want them to. They lay eggs anytime they want and the larvae hatches anytime they want when they are ready. So it's a full-time job sometimes even more. I came in the morning and the larvae were all dead. Yeah, just empty shells. Immediate feeling was just disappointment because like we were so close to that one month mark. I was hoping to reach it yeah. and I made mean, texted meeting <laughs> to <laughs> share my disappointment. <laughs> the day before when she came, they were still swimming and alive. And it was only just overnight and we completely lost our last few. Being the very first batch, you can say that we are very kanjong parents because we don't really know what to feed them. And then we are like, oh no, like, did we do something wrong? Did we rush into the decision of adding another different type of algae and also the number of algae as well? We were trying to juggle many things, you know, increase their survivorship but also being able to run experiments at the same time. So it was definitely very stressful. At the moment, Teresa is really taking helm of the work. She's coming back every day, including the Saturday, Sundays. So my daily routine is taking care of the cowries and the larvae, feed them, observe them, see how far they've developed, and then we take pictures, measurements. It's a lot of work. <laughs> every day I come in and like, I hope to see something new, like something develops further. Yeah, I get very jealous because I have to spend my time between working at home and still at childcare at least the last month. Um, so I get all the updates from her like via WhatsApp. I, I get very excited. Yeah. <laughs> Although we're not in person together, but I think we, we share that joy together. Yeah. They kind of like groom the eggs sometimes. She does. Like, like blowing yeah, yeah, yeah. or like just like touching it, right? But like this one here is not really doing the same thing. That she doesn't move much. It. Yeah, she doesn't move much. But the, her egg look quite small though, this time. Maybe it's a more like a, from an energy mm. uh, resource perspective. Leftovers? Maybe that or it could also be like, you know, um, concentrating the energy in like creating a smaller clutch, but like more robust uh, larvae as well. Harry, you have two tiger cowries that are incubating their eggs at the moment in this tank. Way more than what we expect, to be really honest. Within two months. We thought yeah. that one was a miracle. <laughs> and can close shop. <laughs> and we can, yeah, sort of close shop and, or at least like be able to consolidate what we've learned. We were talking about like, when can we take a short break, uh, you know, and then we were like sometimes talking to our cowries and say, can you please give us a break for a while and, uh, you know, so that... Obviously, you're not listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so we can take a breather and then like understand what we've collected so far. So I guess we got a happy problem right now. <laughs> that having a bit too much success and they're all laying eggs and breeding very well. <laughs> Oh, it's morning, it's morning! Oh, it's morning already! It's usually 8.30 to 9 o'clock. R09. Look at that. My god. Can you take a photo? You can take a video. Yeah. Okay, so 9 has the most. 9 and 10. 9 and 10. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 a lot. 10, 10, 10 is a lot. Uh, so 9. 9, 13 and 10. Uh. Yes. Number 5 has gone off. Oh my god, okay. Everything's going on. Oh, 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 
upside down one is also spawning. Upside down one is spawning. Taiwan upside down, right? Alright. <laughs> it was also spawning. So my expectation initially wasn't that great because coral spawning is a very hit and miss thing. Either you get it or you don't. But this round we had a lot of spawning. Four out of our five colonies spawn. You see like some of them look very pimply. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what setting looks like. Look. Yeah, they're all they're all coming out. In the field you'll see like you'll see the fish before you'll see the corals. Oh. The fish will all flock to the, the spawning coral to eat the eggs. I'm a, I'm a top is the baby of the group uh, for now. Weilong was actually a student of mine. His brain is actually constantly working to come up with a solution or an idea of how to get his experiments to work. How to connect the pipes to give you good flow in the tanks. Experimenting with using apps, just from the touch of a few buttons, you're able to control the water pump. So all these were his, his brain child. We along with his like palm tree stout hair. Probably gets in the way, I guess. <laughs> they stopped already, eh? Uh, no. Uh, still going? The tree is still going. When the corals spawn, it's a very magical experience, I would say. Every egg bundle consists of many eggs and many sperm. Yeah, I'm just gently picking up the egg and sperm bundles. There are egg bundles coming out from every colony. We mix egg bundles from colony A with egg bundles from colony B. Oh, this 9 and 10. We mix them together, they fertilize and we get embryos from them. Not so much. That's what? 9, 9. Alright. Yeah. Put some here. Yeah, next round, next round, next round. Oh, you're so gentle, ah. How rough are you? <laughs> Protocol yeah, is so gentle. gentle. Eh? He's like, wow. So, <laughs> agitating the egg bundles from the two colonies and making sure that they dissociate so the sperm and eggs break apart and they are able to fertilize each other. So when the egg bundles break up, they, they contain both eggs and sperm. And sometimes there is way too much sperm in the water than there are eggs. I'm doing sperm wash, so I'm washing away the excess sperm from the pool of eggs because that's not good for fertilization. Is this to do counting? Right? Yes, we want to know how many embryos per volume. For the current tanks now, we are holding about 20,000 eggs. So we are hoping for at least a couple hundred that will become successful recruits from that. So last year's spawning, we only got two. <laughs> so this is a huge success for, as compared to last year. Why do you the return is so little? Mm, to start somewhere, like I would say. You can't just say that it's difficult and not try it. It's very important that we know about sexual reproduction and how we can do it in a lab setting for future work to develop over. Continuity in science is very important. And I think we've lost quite a few people that you know had this expertise. And coral sexual reproduction research has stalled a little bit over the years. And now we're getting back into it. Getting coral babies, so to speak, or new coral individuals through asexual or vegetative fragmentation is a lot easier and a lot faster. But the pros of sexual reproduction is that you have genetic diversity that we need for an ecosystem to also be resilient. You don't want a monoculture of corals. If that particular coral genotype is prone to a certain disease or certain environmental stress, then you're likely to have everything wiped out. Good afternoon, hope you guys have fun on the Marine Open House. Today uh, is on scientific illustration workshop, but it will be heavily on crabs. 
a good illustration can explain a lot of information. They always say a picture says a thousand words, right? You want to try your hands on drawing now? Yes! Yes, let's draw! So are we drawing enough legs or not? Do we have more legs? Yeah. When people want to study or want to identify them, they can easily use the drawings, right? People don't have to catch them and put them inside again. We draw. Yeah. <laughs> These are some of the local Singaporean corals, corals that we have here. So there are 20 species in this tank. That's like only 10% of what we have in Singapore. We have 200 over species of corals found in Singapore. This is just a small fraction of what we can find here on our reefs. Corals have very, very different shapes and forms. This particular one is one coral. This is, this is one mouth, so one mouth is one unit. But for something like this, you look closer, you see one dot, right? One dot is one coral. So this rock is a thousand over corals easily, a thousand over corals. So this is a coral too? That is also a coral, that is like my, one of my babies. Like. This is a three-year-old coral, so it's one of the faster growing corals. So when it started out, it was a size of a 50 cent coin. So I stuck it to a towel. I can show you what it looks like. The towel is still there. So in three years, it grew to this size. You can see the towel below? Yeah, so this is about three years old. So now it's a mother, like. so it's a mother of other corals. Now you see this gap here? I see this, this gap here. Yeah, so we, we fragment the corals that way. So we break them up and then they'll become colonies on their own next time. So it becomes like a supply like that, a source of corals for us. For the Coral Marine Culture Project, most of our objectives are met in the sense that we have achieved the numbers that we want to achieve. Yeah, so year three is going to be a very busy year for me because I'm doing a part-time master's on corals. I have to work in the day and have classes at night, have a thesis to write in the background, few, few data to collect. Hello, so here is all the bigger corals. So once they are of a big enough size, you either fragment them or you'll, you'll put them out into the reef area. At this size, can you survive? The smaller they are, the harder it is for them to survive. That's why we keep them here. It's like a nursery. So once they are ready of a certain size, then we'll transplant them. Yeah. Uh, we have in this tank about 10, 10 species of corals. Yeah, but we're just mainly working with three, three types to test out our methods. Once it works, we'll test it to different species. My work basically involves growing corals and seeing that the same coral can grow over time depending on what you do to them. It gives me satisfaction in knowing that this kind of work does pay off. On another level, we know that the research that we do can be communicated to the government and it influences policies and management. So, in a sense, it's meaningful to me. So, as the corals get bigger, we just add more bricks until we feel oh. that it's sufficient. Is that why you use it? Correct, yeah. Once you're all mature, then you just move it all out. Yeah, use it for different purposes, restoration or other kinds of research. Um, in the wild, you can actually find them on intertidal places. So they like to hide under rocks and crevices. So sometimes if you turn over a rock, you can find them there. Yeah. How many seagrams in this world? Yeah, so in Singapore, there's actually very, very few of them. So that's why uh, we study this, so that eventually we can get a good supply of uh, juveniles, so that we can restock the populations in the wild. Are these mummies or are these babies? Ah, so these are actually adults. So they can be mummies or daddies. So in this tank, we got two mummies already. Do you want to see the babies? Yeah. Yeah, alright, let's go to the lab then. Okay. Smaller than the ones outside, right? Yeah. yeah. Where is that? Where's that one? Uh, yeah, they're here. Okay. Hiding. Uh, they like to hide because they're very shy. <laughs> so two out of the original, maybe like 500,000. <gasps> yeah. But it's probably the first two juveniles in the world. In the world? <laughs> For this species, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's a lot of challenges because no one has really done it yet. But we actually had quite a bit of success. Of the tiger cowries, we actually have about 28 masses. Right. Yeah, so this is quite an achievement for us. Yeah. yeah. Both the Arabian and tiger cowries are very popular in the aquarium trade. And right. especially for the tiger cowrie, they are heavily harvested in the wild. People like to harvest them for souvenirs. Yeah. So we try to close the cycle and get a sustainable source of juveniles. So translating the science to you know something that's applicable to policy is very is very important to me. This deep-rooted motivation to do what I do. 
So I think next year what we'll do is to see how that can actually be incorporated into you know, management and better practices for sustainable aquarium trade that will be useful for a wider bunch of stakeholders. In the second year, we had, I would consider, raving success with the cowries reproduction and larval development studies. So we have unfortunately neglected a little bit on the giant clams. But in the coming year, there's a lot more exciting things happening for the giant clams and myself, which I'm really, really very excited about. Oh, you're too bad.